How are you, my G? Yeah, I'm well, thank you. Thank you for having me on. Yo, bro, like, it's a pleasure, my G. Thank you. How do I say your name? Janaid. Janaid. I surely ever tried for it. Do you know the maddest <laughs> thing is, yes? <laughs> Honourable shout out to Shilla as well, who uh, helped put this together, yeah? yeah? Absolutely. Enough time she'll say to me, oh, yeah, like, what time um, does... Um, what time are we booking in Janaid or whatever? And I'm thinking, who's because in my mind, I'm like, I'm thinking it's a girl. Yeah. Do you get what I'm saying? Oh, Janaid, I'm like, nah, what? Like, who, what? Some buff thing? What? Have we looked, bu- like, have we booked it on buff thing? Yeah. <laughs> then I realise, oh, no, nah, it's a don. Like, okay, well, cool. Like, cool. Sometimes, obviously, you must get that mixed up sometimes as well, don't it? Like, people I don't think. Know. No, it's the first time I've Wait, you're always a sure guy, yeah? Yeah, it's my guy, yeah. Has, have you ever said, yeah, I'm going to link Janaid, yeah? And then, like, someone's thought, right, like, what? I'll be honest, bro, no. Oh, okay, all right, good. <laughs> <laughs> see, it's exactly <laughs> never. I've had, I've had, I've had um, random pronunciations of the name. Okay. Uh, oh, yeah, because of the way that it's spelled. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, especially Spanish. I've worked with a few Spanish colleagues, and they say, J, but her, it? It's a Junaid. Right, okay. <laughs> Which I prefer in Spanish as well. It sounds sexy in Spanish, isn't it? Junaid. Junaid. But, um, yeah, yeah, bro, girl, first time, bro. But, yeah, it's all right, bro. Oh, yeah. well, listen, bro. Fr- so, fr- so to disappoint you. No. <laughs> man coming with one leg and one arm. <laughs> no butting. <laughs> <laughs> oh, listen, man. Um, look, there's, like, we're going to have... We're gonna have an interesting conversation. There's so many things that I wanna like I wanna ask you. Yeah, of course. Um, and I'm gonna like really get like personal in your life and stuff like that. But there's just a lot of things I just wanna just just on a life one mm. talk to you about. But obviously the majority of the people that are listening to this or are watching this will think like who is this guy? Mm. Like w- w- what's going on here? Um help let's paint the picture. Before, like you had the situation with your with your um, arm and leg, yeah. What was going on in your life? Who like who are who were you? What, what, what like what were you doing? Um, yeah, well, I was a normal East London boy, man. So working, uh, married. I got two kids as well. So yeah, just trying to make ends meet best I can. That's what I was doing. Working, I was in. I've, I've been doing recruitment for the last like. 13 years, so working in recruitment, um, being on the agency side as well as the internal side. So that was a big part of obviously just working all the time on that. Um, COVID was a blessing, so I was working from home at that point. Right. Um, I'd actually taken a jump. Just like, in terms of what the situation was when everything went bang, I was at a point in my life where I would say I was, I was doing recruitment, uh, work was going well, family, young family, two kids. Um, the wife was happy for once. Mm. Uh, gym, I loved my gym as well. I was big into my gym. So going to gym like literally sometimes two times a day because um, I mean, I went for a journey of losing weight. The original name I had was Thick to Slick with some of my boys right. trying to piss at me sometimes. So the original Instagram name and YouTube and all that was Thick to Slick because I went from like 16 stones down to like 12 and a half stones over a period of oh, two man. years. Wow. Um, so I went through that and now, you know you know yourself going to the gym it becomes a big part of your life so that was a big part of what I was do day, day to day motorbikes bikes was never thing I was into okay yeah so um, bike life like super bike with my boys um, yeah literally every weekend in the summer out on bikes in the winter chancing as well sometimes uh, yeah that was me I was a happy go lucky guy man there was nothing I was healthy there was no I had no allergies no like doctors often look at my case and they're like, right, so what's wrong with you now? Like, what's wrong? I'm like, nothing. I've had what I had. It's caused this now. But before this, I had no allergies. Before this, I was on no medications. I'm only on medications now. Um, so I, I, was, I was perfectly normal, man. What type of man would you say that you were? Like, were you like, I know you said that obviously family balance, all of that type of stuff, work, gym, whatnot. Like, what, like, what was your temperament like on just a normal one? Like, who, like what, what type of man would you say you were? Um, an honest one? Be, yeah, think, be yeah, honest. Yeah, yeah, yeah. An, an honest one. I, I reckon I was just an honest guy, man. Like, I, I've never been one, I guess, I've never been one to fight. I've never been a fighter. Uh, I'm always more that guy, hence probably the reason why I'm in recruitment. I always like to negotiate myself out of situations. 
and I find myself a bit of a talker. Um, a family man, a naughty Muslim boy, I would say. Right. Definitely, right? So um, from an Islamic point of view uh, and just a religious point of view, I, was, I wasn't religious at all. Um, going out and doing all the things that I shouldn't be doing. Mm. That was a big part of my life. Yeah, I, I, I don't know how to say if I was a strong guy mentally mm. because I'd never been put in a situation where my mental strength had been tested. Right. Um, obviously, like not obviously, but people have those close friends and family and loved ones who pass away and you have that grieving cycle mm. when those people pass away. But has anything happened to me personally where I can say, all right, yeah, my mental state was really tested? Mm. Um I've always been a family man, like, because of how my family's been run in terms of mom, mom and dad and my sisters. Mm. So I'm the eldest of, I'm the eldest, eldest of four siblings. I've got three younger sisters. Right. Yeah. So I've always, I've always been a mommy's boy. I'll say it straight, right? I've always been a mommy's boy. But having those younger sisters and those girls, it was, it was a really a female orientated mm. environment. So mm. I have a, a very soft side to me as well. Mm. Um, I'm a mummy's boy as well, man. Yeah, I'll be honest up, with you. I'm a mummy's boy. I got, I got a great relationship with my dad still. And there's a lot of me in my dad. No, there's a lot of my dad in me in the way that he like operates and his mm. temperament and whatever else, definitely. But yeah, bro, like I'm like I'm a hundred percent a mummy's boy, bro. It's mad. See where I'm on where I'm opposite to that is I'm not close to my dad. Oh right. Yeah, like um, uh, if if anything ever happened to me, um, do you know it's mad like this. Like I, I won't jump too many steps ahead, but like even when all this rah rah happened, which we'll get into, I'm sure. Mm-hmm. When I woke up, like I wanted mummy. Right, you know I mean, like, straight away. Yeah, I wanted mummy. Like when my daddy was there, and dad, dad, obviously, like dad, like I got upset because because I didn't get along with my dad, and I saw how upset my dad was. It hit home, like right. The way, because me and my dad argue a lot, mm-hmm. but seeing him the way he was when all that happened to me, that first few months, yeah, I got I felt like I got a bit closer, but then when I come back round, it was back to yeah, mummy in it, like yeah. I don't have respect for dad for a number of reasons. I'm gonna get, I'm gonna get into that a little bit more. Yes, um, also, by the way, if you see me tap, I'm making notes. Yeah, cause I don't, I don't want to leave here and think right, I didn't ask that or I didn't. Do you get what I'm saying? So okay, like. Now paint this picture where things started to change a bit for you. Mm. Well, I say a bit, but like, like talk me through that first day where something was a little bit wrong. Mm. Okay, um, so September, what date was that? I, Newcastle United, the game Ronaldo came back. I think that was, I think that was 20th of September 21. I don't know. At some point in September, put it on the screen. A week. There's a screen. The screen's not on, is it? It's alright. It's cool. So a week before that, I went to a house party, right? And a couple of weeks before that, if I'm going before that, there was quite a few birthday parties. Our boy Jamal from my bike group here had his birthday party. Um, my cousin had his birthday party. So there's a lot of going out, right? And I'll tell you why I said that in a minute. So a week before that football game. I started getting a twinge in my right knee, be like, be behind the knee, like a muscle twinge. And I thought maybe it's just twinging because of the football I'd been playing on the weekend before, five aside, the twinging because of that. So that twinging started happening, but then a week after that, went to the United game on that Saturday, and uh, on the way back, so I went to that football game, my kids' first ever United game at, at United, at Old Trafford, um, and on the way back, that twinge turned into almost like a burning sensation right. under the right foot, right? Burning to a point where I couldn't even sleep with a duvet over my foot because it was just, it was too sensitive. So that pain started, so I got out of bed and I was like, so go back from the football, drive back, got out of bed and I hit the floor and I'm like, right, what's going on? So at first I thought, yeah, it's just pins and needles, it'll go after maybe half an hour or so. Um, no, I didn't go. Then went downstairs and then I could still walk on it a little bit, but then the foot started swelling a bit as well. So the foot started swelling, and then I was like, right, I need to go and get it checked out. So I first rang the GP, and um, 
GP started, but GP basically started doing the GP routine that book an appointment, come in, blah, 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 right? So I booked that in with them. Dan didn't go nowhere. Now tell me, Chucky, you asked me one question, but I might have gone ahead a few steps here. You've gone ahead a few steps? Yeah, of the story. Should I just carry on? No, 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 <laughs> no. Go back if you want. Yeah. Like, go, bro, if you feel, feel like you need to go back, go back. Yeah, no, no, I no, want to no. know everything. Yeah, no, so, yeah, so that's the main thing. That was, that was the, the foot pain was the main thing. Right. I kicked it all off. Right. Um, and that foot pain, that like I said, I played five-side football. Um, I sprained my ankle a couple of times, but nothing like severe had happened the day before or on yeah, that yeah, day. Yeah. Yeah. It just came on and it started like gradually getting worse. To the point I went to the GP... <laughs> To the point I went to the GP and um, they didn't know what was going on. So they referred me to, they told me to go A&E. Mm-hmm. So I went A&E and A&E again. Could you walk, wait, could you walk though still? Crutches. Crutches, yeah, okay. So at this point, a week, two weeks into the pro, into the pain, I, I was on crutches. Wow. So yeah. that, it kind of progressed kind of quick then? Yeah, it did, yeah. So I was on crutches. Within a couple of weeks, I was on crutches. Um, and they couldn't figure out so I went A&E and they thought maybe because it was foot pain and it came from nowhere they thought maybe it's sciatica okay right so at the a and E, I I remember um, they said right Mr Ahmed it's your sciatica nerve so I'm like well what should I do they said well try this this and this stretches to be honest I wasn't really listening because I knew it wasn't sciatica took some painkillers went home um, tried the stretches nothing happened yeah so then I thought right rags I'm going to go to my booper because I had Bupa from my work. I actually went through Bupa from my wife's work, yeah? So I went through the Bupa and I was like, let me go see a few people privately and see what they say. So now we're talking around maybe into January time. So January, I start seeing a few private people in my local private hospital. Um, first, I see a muscle specialist. He doesn't know what's going on. He refers me to a nerve specialist. He doesn't know what's going on. He refers me to a back specialist. He doesn't know what's going on. They refer me back to another specialist. He doesn't know what's going on. In that time, this is like January, February time. This is taking up up into end of February. You know what I mean? So um, then I'm thinking out of uh, avenues. So I've tried acupuncture. Right. So I thought, rags, let me pay for acupuncture privately. So I've paid 100 quid a session. Acupuncture had like maybe 10 sessions. Nothing, it hasn't helped. Because I thought maybe acupuncture will hurt the, help with the nerve pain. Maybe it's nerve but no, it's not getting any better. The burning sensation is still there. Was uh, it, was, see the burning sensation, yeah? Was it like, would it b- become more extreme and then decrease? Or was it just sort of like, did it, like sort of a, f- a flat line kind of, just the same type of pain throughout? It just didn't f- fluctuate at all? Um, yeah, I would say it was the same. Okay. So, so most of the time it was the same, like, if the foot was if the foot was ever touching anything, then obviously it felt a bit worse. But I wouldn't let it touch anything for it to feel worse because I didn't want that pain. Okay. So it, it it was always there. I know, like in I know, obviously it's not even nearly the same. But I guess that feeling of like when you do have pins and needles on your foot and you put your foot on the floor, you can almost feel that that like sensation more in it. So if you've got that continuously which is it's not like a, uh, a pins and needles type thing, but that type of pain, obviously you're gonna to wanna to just keep that foot off the floor yeah. as much as possible, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And also the other thing was swelling. So okay. um, I'll chuck a pair of trainers on, and yeah, by the end of the day, boy, the Mad. it was balloon, yeah. To a point, right, I shouldn't say this, right, but I'm gonna say it, I don't care. I was left foot braking and right foot accelerating because the pressure of the accelerator is always softer, right? So I could press, I could press the accelerator because it's soft, but I couldn't hit a brake hard if I had to hit it hard. Right, okay. That, too much pressure. So you would use that. So I was left foot braking, right? right okay. Right okay. foot accelerating. Um, so that's why I can left foot brake, but anyway. So, yeah, so that was happening. And that took me up to maybe February, March, April, April time, April, May time, until I finally, so April time, I finally saw a guy um, who said to me, You've got something, again, in that same hospital, he said, You've got something with long term pain syndrome is what he called it okay what what's that well it's exactly how it sounds in the title it's just where the, and i googled it and i've researched it and all it says is it's where the brain is constantly sending pain signals or you're getting pain signals constantly from an area of your body to your brain and it can't be stopped 
Are you putting it on the screen? How do I say that? What's it called? How do I say that? Uh, Pali. I'll just put it on the screen. People can kind of decipher that for themselves. Um, okay. Chronic persistent pain that carries on for longer than 12 weeks despite uh, medication or treatment. So it's just the brain is just constantly just... Yeah. And you can't... It's turn off. How did you feel when they told you that? Did you take... Because I know, like, before, when he was telling you that... Like, the other guy was telling you sciatica or whatever else, you kind of just flicked off and was like, I just know it's not that. But if he, when he told you that, did that hit a little bit differently? Or not really? Did you still think, nah, man? So, imagine everyone... Imagine you searching for an answer for saying, right, and no one's giving the answer. And then suddenly someone's got the answer. How would you, like... How would you react to that person? Do you know what? It's, that's an interesting question based upon the answer that has been given. Because I think that there would probably be, you know, like if you said to me, you know what, you've got a, and then they gave me a, the mad scientific word, then I think like, obviously I'm taking that mad scientific word. But if a, di if a doctor basically said to me, you've basically got long-term pain thing. I've, I, that would take a long time for me to process because it just sounds too simple. What do you mean? Like, yeah. what do you mean the brain is just saying that I'm just in pain? Like, I, I feel like I would find that extra difficult to to accept than maybe the, the scientific terminology. Do you get what I'm saying? Yeah, absolutely. And um, I wish I had the chucky brain on when he said it to me because... I was like, right, someone's giving me a solution to a problem. And because th this pain was, mate, it was not allowing me to go gym. Like, I couldn't go and play football. Mm. I couldn't, but my kid plays football three times a week. And we always used to have a kick about beforehand, before he could, went and done his proper training. Couldn't do that because I, could, like, I couldn't put any weight on it. Couldn't do shopping, couldn't do nothing. So finally, someone's giving me a bit of light that, but. I don't know exactly what it is, but everyone else so far has said, we don't know, we don't know, maybe, maybe, we don't but you've know. You've got one person that one said, person it's said this. Yeah. I hear that. Yeah? yeah. So he said to me, and I'm thinking, right, finally someone's got an inkling. I'll take the inkling. Right, I hear I'll, that. I'll take it. And um, so his initial, and it was also not just that, Chucky, it was also the, um, the solutions he came up with. Like the first solution which I went for was. Uh, an injection so your spine it's got two parts of it I can't remember exactly what they're called but there's an outer and an inner layer right so the first or the second injection could be vice versa was on the outer layer see if that kills the pain if that doesn't work then we'll do the inner layer layer the injection you're, you're fully awake they they basically inject this with a certain numbing agent which should help the pain right so that was the first two solutions that we're going to try done the first one waited two weeks didn't work uh the doctor said all right now that didn't work we tried a second solution at this point he then started planting the seed there is a third option right and that third option was the one which i uh, yeah so the third option was a device inserted in your back and what this device was it was a size of a um pacemaker almost yeah uh, inserted in your lower back and this device would then have two metal wires that will go inside the spine, right? And those metal wires, along with that device, will almost act as a uh, diversion for the pain signals. So when that pain signal came from the foot to that device, or to your where your nerves run through your back, that device will pick you up and send the signal as like a buzzing sensation. Mm -hmm. So it'd be like a, you almost get like a a slight buzzing, shocking sensation instead of that sharp pins and needles sensation. Um, so I had that second operate, that second injection and then he started talking about that third option um, and the second, obviously the six, second solution didn't work. So I then went ahead with that device to be inserted. And what was that process like? So what that process was, it was a day operation, um, done the whole 
pre-COVID checks because they were still going on, no temperature, come in the next day, blah, blah, private hospital. So I went downstairs, um, signed all the forms. So, you know, you sign your life away, like, this happens, this happens, yeah, happens, yeah, yeah. yeah. So I signed your life away. Um, and they told me beforehand what we're going to do is they're going to insert a device. Um, no, so a day before that, actually, the lady from the um, company that designs the, devi- the devi- device showed me the device, uh, showed me the little controller it comes with. So the way the device works is the device goes in you, but you charge it from outside. Do you like these, oh, okay. you know, like these new iPad uh, yeah, 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 you just see docking stations, yeah? Yeah, yeah? Like that, like a belt, you tie it on, right. and it charges it, plugs in, charges it, okay. while you sleep at night time. And there's a remote with it, which can change how strong that buzzing sensation I spoke about comes back to you, how strong the feedback is, right? So she had a chat with me a day before, Boston Medical, they're called, to talk about that particular device. This is what we've done. Research us gave me a few leaflets to read through, which I did. Everything looked hunky-dory, right? Um, looking back now, it was a, it was a, fuck, it was a sales pitch, basically to make sure I was happy. I was gonna go ahead with the device, um, but I was still in that mindset of, shit, that this sounds like it might work. My wife in the background was like, "Have you done enough research?" But I kept blanking it out. I was like, "Right, I something. just need something that's gonna get rid of the pain, fix this pain." Yeah, and like, in the background now, obviously thinking about it now, like you think, "Oh, yeah, shit." She was saying to me, "Like, have you done this research, that research?" But I was like, no, I'm gonna go for it. I'm gonna go for it, innit? Being a stubborn man as well, I'm like, I'll go for it. I know what I'm talking about. So anyway, so I went in for a day procedure. Um, Chucky, they woke me up. And th- again, thinking about now, they woke me up during the procedure to see if the device was working. You what? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, and now, like, now I'm talking to. Obviously, you're here, you'll know why now. I'm talking to legal people when they bring these sort of things up. Like, I'm like, right, yeah, I was. They woke me up because what they did, they woke me up to make sure the device was working. And she, like, imagine I'm lying down here, like, but I'm flat on my stomach in it. They're behind me working on my spine. They woke me up and going, like, is the device working? And she's come around like a f- mad scientist with a laptop, and she's doing all this shit like activating the device. And she's like, is it working? And I'm like, yeah, but it's not going. And I'm, like, I'm half out of it, you know. They give you that and the setting and stuff. I'm half out of it. I'm like, yeah, yeah, it's working. And then she's like, oh, is it working now? And I'm like, no, no, it's not working now. And I, that I, is and mad. Then, but then I hear a doctor. I remember now. I'm thinking back. I hear a doctor say, oh, and he pushes it a bit. And he's like, is it working now? He's asking me. <laughs> wait. So wait, are they waiting for you to be in like some type of pain or some like? So they're on the other end. They're pushing the foot. They're pushing the foot to see, right, are you getting a buzzing sensation and is the device working? Bruv, I'm half out of it. Yeah, 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 of course. Like, you're, you're twisted, bruv. Yeah, you trust don't even... me. I'm, I'm like, I'm in damn. I'm out of it. <laughs> trust me. I'm out of it, bruv, fully. I'm sitting in Bulldog, bruv. I'm out of it. Yeah, I hear camp. You hear it? I don't know if you've been damn. Trust me. So and, what are you um, telling them at this point? Fam, I just... Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Back out again. Woke up again. And um, they're like, okay, Mr. Ahmed, like, if it's got fine, how do you feel? Have a cup of coffee, a cup of tea, blah, blah. Um, here's a couple of leaflets. Wait a couple of hours for me to feel a bit better. Come back to it. And then, yeah, wife, wife picked me up and I went home the same day. Did it work? No. Simple answer. So I waited a couple of days. I thought, like, well, firstly, I was really sore because I mean, the stitches down below there. Um, so I was quite sore. Uh, so I was trying to walk on it. I was like, no, nah, this, this hasn't worked. So I called him. I think, again... Did it, it made no difference no, at all? No difference at all. Wow. Yeah, so then obviously I'm a bit pissed. And I'm thinking, like, shit, what's going on? Why is it not working? So then I rang the doctor up and I said, like, it's not working. They have spoke to, spoken to Boston Medical, the rep, and uh, they've booked an appointment for me um, in, in two weeks' time for us to review what's going on and see why it's not working. So like all the while you're still like, so you've got this device in you and you're still going through the pain. Yeah. And so at that point, like obviously your life is just completely just changing by the moment, right? Because you, I know you mentioned obviously football, like all of these different things that you can't do. So you're just actually getting used to, or trying to just get used to what's happening in that moment, right? Yeah. So then what next? Um, so what, a week and a half later, um, 
my wife is screaming like she's seen it this morning when I hit my head there was blood on the floor she was, I thought she was going to pass out so she was like I'm not cleaning up bandage for you so my dad come and clean my bandage for me the bandage on the back oh okay you better clean your bandage clean your bandage uh, like after a week at least okay. to make sure everything's like when you have a scar especially like this is good advice as well like when you get an operation or have any type of scar make sure it's not smelling make sure there's no redness because that's a sign of infection okay so if your scar is ever smelling or like it's going to smell nasty you'll know and it's red or pussing yeah you've got an infection yeah, yeah, yeah. so the reason why I say that is my dad checked it there was no swelling I got a picture of it as well um, no because I took a picture on purpose um, no swelling no nothing right so that's like a week and a half after uh, and then I basically then by the way is this it is this what's this here you're showing me uh, attaching spectral weed right up Spinal cord stimulus. Yeah, yeah, that's the one, yeah. That's the one, yeah. That's the one, yeah. Okay. Crazy. Is, is there, yeah. is there, um, is, does the Boston one come up? Yeah, I typed in from Boston Scientific. Yeah, that's their one, then, yeah. That's the one, yeah. Yeah, that's the one, yeah. So, um, yes, yeah, so I got a temperature, Chuck. So, sorry, I'll call you Chuck. Yeah, it's calm, it's yeah, calm. It's calm, calm sorry. Um, so, yeah, so two weeks after, like I said to you, the bandage was all clean, everything. The reason why I said that is because I got a temperature. Right, so I was like, shivers. I think it's shit saying it right. So I'm shivering, right? I'm like three, four um, duvets, like those typical Asian, like we call them gumballs, yeah, like thick duvet over me. I'm like, yeah, mum's bringing me hot water, but I'm shivering. And I go to my missus, I said, this ain't right, like I shouldn't be shivering. Firstly, like I, sh I can't be moving a lot anyway. I was literally in bed, only playing COD for two weeks. Mm -hmm. And um, so I couldn't be moving, but I, like, I couldn't, stay still and um, I rang up the private doctor the hospital and I said look this is happening they go you got, you've got to go to your local NHS because we're closed at the time it was happening so I went private to my pri um, NHS hospital um, temperature yeah high temperature I don't know what high temperature is anymore it's like 40, is it 40 degrees I think yeah I think so 38 yeah for high, like high temperature what is considered as a like a, a uh, normal body temperature is 36 so you, I would say like 40 36. something yeah 40, 40 yeah, 38 yeah. to 40 in it so it was around there went into hospital um, with the missus obviously that mindset oh shit we're going to be here for ages a &E. um sat down ordered a favourite chicken and chips yeah munch which one yeah. which chicken and chips this is necessary favourites oh favourites yeah I was in Essex oh, in it I was in I was in, in East I was in like ain't favourites one of them like kind of dim PF you know like yeah, you I, see the black like, PFC <laughs> Perfect fried chicken and that, like them kind of dim ones. <laughs> Any one of them ones? <laughs> favorites. Yeah, uh, Fav no, PFC. Favorites so, is PFC. PFC is more my lane than Bow side, I think. What? Yeah, yeah, but ain't favorites in that kind of lane? Then one of them. Years, yeah, but favorites is one of them dim ones, though, isn't it? Like Tennessee, though. What yes, like ten, ten, like Tennessee. That's like one of the dim ones. Is that one of your favourite well, joints? How are you going to call me East and try to call my chicken and chips dim? What's your West London chicken and chips, bro? We. Tennessee. You don't have one. It was Tennessee. Exactly, you don't have that one. Was Tennessee. <laughs> it was Tennessee. South still. has got. But South then, and then we, well, obviously, we've got a young Sam's as well. You know yeah, what I mean? Yeah. Sam's, was at, Sam's was our thing. Sam's was our thing. To uh, be Sam's fair. is in East now as well. Is it, yeah? Yeah. yeah Sam's, you, Sam's, 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 you could get like nine pieces of chicken and two chips, bare wings for like three pounds. You old. It's like, yo, <laughs> you old. <laughs> where's this coming from? <laughs> but you know what? When you're young, you know what I mean? But yeah, I'm, I'm more of just the KFC done now. No, actually, cheat meals. That's my thing now. Cheat meals is a new thing. But yeah, anyway. Yeah, that's all right. We, we, yeah, we. No, I, just to put it straight, I think it's Dixie. Dixie. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And ah, South yeah, is Morley's, yeah, yeah. isn't it? That's Pigeon, so isn't it, though? Yeah. It's about Pigeon. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> up north is Pigeon. <laughs> but I, Chuck, I ain't gonna lie to you, yeah, going off subject. I remember in uni, yeah, in Birmingham, my boy's taking me to one chicken shop, yeah. The fillet, bro. The fillet was like this thick and this big. I was like, fuck, this is definitely pigeon, bro. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Bro, I hear that. How you pay, know what? You how, bite into it and just bare water comes out of it. <laughs> bro, the fact it's two pounds for that fillet, no. It's pigeon. Anyway, yeah. yeah anyway. So, we had, so we had chicken and chips. Wow. And um, that's the last thing I remember. So I got hyped day. I passed out. And um, yeah, like my wife says, I was in and out of conscious, but it all kicked off from there. So up until that point, yeah, that's, that's literally the point where everything just went, basically. So, well, you literally just passed out yeah, in and passed out. Yeah, and everything started from there. So, that must have been, that must have put your wife in a mad predicament, actually. 
So now when you've gone to the hospital and that, and they're like doing operations on you or whatever else, she's obviously um, almost like, she's your what, kind of next to kid in it. So she's going to obviously be the person who's going to be, you know, saying what they can do, what they can't do and whatever. At what point? At what point did you wake up? Did you wake up and everything had changed then, or did they have like, did they? Did you have an opportunity for them to talk to you about what was happening and what was gonna be the solution going forward? Yeah. Um, so I woke up. So I spent uh, six weeks in a induced coma. Wow. Um, and then after that six weeks, I woke up on a shitload of drugs. Big up NHS. Uh, in <laughs> in UCLH, um, but I, but when I mean when I mean shitload of drugs, I mean like I was turning around looking at a clock, and I don't know if you've seen Alice in Wonderland. Yeah, 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 yeah. But in Alice in Wonderland, I always say this: in Alice in Wonderland, there's a clock where the twelve's up there, the three's up down here, six is there, nine's there. But I, I, oh, so you spazzed. I was. I was out, I was looking around and I was like, raw, what is going on? But so to say I woke up at that point and knew exactly what was happening is probably a lie. I was awake, but boy, I didn't know what was going on. I think not until I got out of intensive care, which was, so induced coma six weeks, intensive care probably for another two months, and then I went into a normal ward. So yeah, not until I got to normal ward, I knew exactly what was gonna be happening to me. What was happening? For you to pass out now, like, and for you to be in that coma, what did they find out that you had? Like, what what was actually happening? Yeah. So at Queens, what happened is, um, at that point, they were talking to my wife, saying uh, he's got sepsis, um, and we're giving everything to him that we would usually do to a sepsis patient, but he's not getting better. Like, what's going on? So the best way to put it Chuck is they they threw the book at me at Queen's basically they were like look so we're giving everything in the book to um, to cure sepsis but it's not working his, his organs are still going into failure um, they gave me chemo they gave me two rounds of like the strongest chemotherapy they can give and if you look at my Instagram or my YouTube they um, you'll see like I was like do you know that Russian spy that was a skeleton I looked like that guy yeah so when I woke up um, so they put me through chemo, but what was happening, and then they took my bone marrow, because they put my bone marrow to a panel of hospitals in London, which included King's, UCLH, and there was like two or three other ones that my wife knows, um, because they couldn't work out what was going on. My bone marrow went to a panel, and then while someone on that panel, um, Jessica Manson, over at UCLH, she saw the bone marrow and done her tests, and she said, he's got another disease called HLH. Now you'll have to, for the life of me, Google HLH. We did. Do it, pull it up on the screen. Because I can't pronounce it. So HLH is basically where your immune system just shuts down. It, it's called, I'm gonna I'm gonna say it right now. Yeah, you got this? I believe I do, I sure. don't know. You go, go go before, it, go no, before it comes up, innit? <laughs> um, it is hemo, um, phagocytic, cytic. Lymphmo the histo histio septis cytosis and hence the reason why we call it HLH. Hell. <laughs> I know. Was it Chucky Chai? Hemo Hemo Oh fuck. Hemophagogetic Citic Lymphmo Histo Histio. Histio. Cytosis. Oh, yeah, that's mad. You know what? When I read, like, when I um, saw it in the notes, yeah, to yeah. me, it just looked like a, I, like, it just looked like a jumbled words, yeah. Um, EA, you studied, what did you study? Biomedical science. Biomedical science, yeah. So he was able to say it straight away and he was breaking down exactly what part of it. In fact, come here quickly, just quickly, and then say it, what each, each part means because oh, you broke it down to me. Where is it? Okay, it primary. Huh? It breaks it down. So hemo no, but you... Okay, you broke it down differently to me, though. Yeah, hemo's blood. Oh, yeah, hemo's blood. Phagocytic. Uh, phagocytic is the cells that eat. So you're basically your white blood cells. So it's basically your white blood cells. And then... Um, lymphomo. 
Related. is relating to the lymph oh yeah the, the, your system basically yeah. and, and then the histo histiocytosis, histiocytosis. And it says excess of macrophages so an access of microfit I don't know what it is excess, excess of macrophages what is that they're a type of white blood cell it's a type of white, white blood cell yeah so uh, yeah that's a lot um, Moses if you don't mind me asking did you did you study that as part of it at any point in the he actually he did yeah. yeah so every exactly. doctor said to me they touched on it for like maybe two two well, assignments they did they go two lectures but it never came up in our exams yeah, yeah see it there so yeah. that's how rare this thing that's is that's how rare this thing is yeah, yeah. And please so people please put hear, it in your he point said, yeah. he said um, when you say two lectures but it just never came up in the exam it's mad right so yeah so um, so she knew I had HLH mm hmm um, so she goes, that's why then, then, that's why they then had to, no, before that, Chucky, sorry, so before that, they, they needed to take the device out, because the device was still in my body. Of course. Right, so I was getting sepsis, not curing it, before they started throwing the chemo at me, they took the device out, because they thought, okay, now the device, it must be the cause of the infection, that's what they said, I'm not saying that, they said that, and they took it out, but the infection was still not going. That's when they sent the bone marrow off, and then it was then they found out it was HLH. So then Jessica Manson was like, "Right, we need to treat him here at, at UCLH." Who's but, Jessica Manson? So she's the she specialises in this disease and research around this. Right. And she was only one of a few doctors who had seen it. It's very common in children. Oh, really? Yeah, it's very common. So um, since big yeah, big yeah, up big Jessica, up Jessica Manson. Manson. Yeah, so um, since putting this information out there, and I do, I do TikTok lives, I've had people say to me, I've had a kid who had HLH, he was, or she was, six months old or three years old. Like, it's, it's common in kids, but I've had no one, no adult come to me and say, oh, yeah, I've, I've heard of it, or anyone come to me and said I've heard it in an adult. And that's why they gave me 20% chance. At that point, um, they told my wife I had 20% chance of living. So they, they basically said, come say goodbyes. And my dad had started ringing up my cousins and saying, like, guys, it's not good. Mm. And they started, like, my family had started coming around, which I now find out from stories. My family had started coming around and saying, like, my dad was sort of saying things like, um, oh, he had a good laugh though, innit? Like, his kids, he, he seen one of his kids grow up a bit, like that sort of stuff. Um, so, yeah, so, um, so they had to get me over to UCLH as quick as possible but I wasn't stable enough to move because I was on a lot of equipment and um, I mean my wife was saying today cause, oh, because I, I banged my head this morning guys for you to, just to find out how much of a numpty I am I banged my head on the, on the cabinet and so we had to go to the hospital and at the hospital a lady was coming in for a, a CT scan on all the pipes that I was on like all the, the tubes they put into you I was on those same sort of tubes but seeing that my wife broke down and said that's how you were like Okay. Yeah, so like one minute you went for an operation to have that device taken out, and next minute you came back out like that. Like I had all the pipes in me, tubes in me, like wires coming out left, right, and centre. So for her, just for her, mm. like she goes to me, um, yeah, it was a lot. It was a lot, like, um, yeah, because they thought I was gone in it. They thought. Yeah, there's a massive roller coaster of emotions that they're going through. One minute you obviously you've got a pain in your leg, your foot. You're going in and out of hospital and that, and then all of a sudden someone gives you a solution and that doesn't change. And then all of a sudden, like you pass out and that, and then next minute now you your missus being told that, you know, her partner and the father of her kids is about to like die. Like it's uh, I could I could only imagine that's just a, a lot to process in it. And then also on top of that, your I think this is where it's different for a, a wife as opposed to like just a mother and a father and that because I think your wife lives with you. She's with you all of the time. You have kids together. She's obviously going through her emotions of like losing a partner. Obviously parents go through the emotions of losing a child and that. But then also the wife is taking on the emotions of everyone else and then I can probably imagine that a lot of the time people are asking your wife questions. What's happening? What's going on with this? What's going on with that? And it's like, 
you know you want to say you want to you're cool with saying it once or twice but then when you have to say it over and over and over and over again, as well as you're like starting the process of grieving, it's mental. Yeah, it's it mental. Um, and it was it was hard, friend. Um, we have spoken about that part of it as well. Because I wanted to know, like, I've just been nosy, just so who turned up, do you know what I mean? Hmm. Like when people found out who turned hmm, up. Hmm. Who turned up? Um... <laughs> um, yeah, the family I was expect the family I was expecting to turn up turn up. Uh, the friends that I was expecting to turn up, I would say it was fifty fifty. Was there anyone out of your friendship group that, like, in all honesty, mm. you not only expected to turn up but really wanted to be there, mm. didn't come? Yeah, there was there was. Um, I reckon there, were, there was one cousin especially I would say um, so yeah me and him have been tight for years like he knows my bike group my bike boys know him so I don't mix my bike boys with my like school boys or my family like, my families sometimes they mix and they come in and out but I don't mix all my different groups together for, for just the way it works out and um, even my bike boys know one or two of my cousins and uh, yeah Faye he turned up when I came when I was in that loopy stage he turned up because I wasn't myself at that point I was crying and I was like trying to get to the terms of the fact why I've woken up like a vegetable mm. and like the last time I remember I was walking into hospital and now I can't move anything mm. um, he turned up for the first time but then after that he didn't turn up at all to come and see me whereas other people who there was also people who I didn't expect to turn up who came and knocked on my front door who I hadn't spoken for years because mm. they got it through the grapevine. Mm -hmm. um, but that, I'm going to say, you know, one particular cousin let me down, man. And I gave him, do you know what is, Chucky, even afterwards, like me and my boy here, we, we spoke about it, that I I gave him, what do you call it? I gave him an olive tree? What do you call it? A branch. Olive branch, yeah. Well, I gave him an olive, olive tree, you know. I gave, literally, I gave him a tree, bro. I said, come, come and chat to me. But, um, it's not, I don't feel like, and like, I'll say openly here, like, I, I've had counselling for my stuff as well, yeah? And my counsellor said to give me one piece of advice, which I'm happy to share. He goes, Janaid, the, the, where you are now, you can be, you can be, um, oh, what's the word I'm looking for? You can be, you can think about, you can put yourself first. You know what I mean? Like, you don't need to put other people first. Mm. The shit you've gone through, you don't need to put anyone else first. You put yourself first. But even then, I went out and said, look, bro, I miss you, innit? Come, like, I want to see you. I didn't put in that exact words, but I gave the hint. Did he come then? No, still hasn't come. Mad. Still hasn't come. So, um, <laughs> so, you know you love your barber, innit? But I had to change your barber. My barber's recently, and we have one barber as a family. So this one barber goes to all of us. So he goes to my cousins, brothers, my cousins or cousins. Like he goes to everyone. He makes mega pee of us. But now I decided to go, him as well, go to him as well. And the mad one is, he came through, I think, came through on Wednesday. And um, my, that cousin has said something to him as a message to me. But he, my barber's been like, I ain't telling him, tell him yourself. Because mm. I think it's now I got to a stage where it's almost embarrassing to turn up. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? So then you get to that point where you're like, Yeah, he's left it so long. That right, you don't you leave something too long, you're like, mm. Shit, how do I approach this now? If you have an argument with a boy or well, rags, you put it to a girl context. You, know, you don't say something when you're meant to or do something, it's gone too long. No, I hear that still. I hear that, like. Do you still have a desire to want to speak to that cousin? Very good question. Oh, I don't know, man. I don't know. Because then you start, do you start doing, then you start thinking about what did that person bring to the table? Mm. Do you know what I mean? Now, when you start thinking, oh, I've, I've done this, I've done that. Oh, he's a bit younger as well, Chucky. Like, I'm 36. He's, a bit, he's like 27, I think he's 28 now. Um, 
So I was already in that journey. You have, I was in that London life, and he was starting to become a city boy. Right. So I introduced him to the city boy lifestyle, and I got out of it. He was still in there, but I was still in that life because of him. Mm. And then all the shit sort of happened, and we're in between because he stepped away from city life as well. Uh, like just in, to give you context in terms of how we were, we had nights out and mm. we've done stuff together. And, um, oh, bruv, I don't know, man. Yeah, these things, <laughs> these things, um, it changes a lot of different things in your life, man. Like friends, family, like so much different things. I'm going to get into that. I'll get into that in a bit still. But like, so now, see when you was like now conscious of what was going on at this point now, you're like, they've had to cut your leg off and your arm. Yeah. Or did do you have an opportunity to, to like, to have that conversation on whether they this was something that you wanted yeah yeah um so when i when i woke up everything was still intact so what had happened is um because of the blood infection they had to give me blood diffusions but what happens is when they gave me the blood diffusions um the blood didn't go back to certain parts of the body and that caused gangrene okay so the left arm was just where the elbow is. Um, the right leg was below knee, and the left toes had gangrene. So at this point, I was a vegetable. So I had, I was still coming around to things anyway. So I wasn't fully aware of what was going to happen. I mean, my missus had started mentioning the fact that there might be amputations needed because of the state of certain body parts. But at that point, my main concern was I've still got my right hand there and there was like little scars and I got little scars where the gangrene, gangrene wanted to start but it didn't go the whole way mm-hmm. it just started tinkering but it, it left it, it let it be um, so at that point it was just gangrene and I was like a vegetable so I was starting physio to get my strength back to just be able to even sit up because I couldn't like literally when I say I was a vegetable like I couldn't even do that like my fingers were just there uh, Chucky, I couldn't even do the buzzer, you know? You, in the hospital, you get those buzzers. Mm-hmm. So, uh, when you're in intensive care, your nurse is right next to you, like constantly, like, literally you go nurse and he or she is there all the time. But when you get into, off the intensive care, into a ward, they've got a ward of 20 odd patients with like maybe six or 10 nurses. So, first come, first serve, when you press the buzzer, you know what I mean? Mm. But I couldn't press the buzzer. Oh, mad. So imagine my mindset when I'm there, like, because first I was like, when I was in intensive care, to my mates and to my missus and family, I was like, right, if I get out of intensive care and get into a a normal ward, it's going to be sick. In my head, I'm thinking, yeah, I'll get out of intensive care. It's the next step to recovery. But then when I got to, when they moved me, yeah, from um, intensive care to the ward, my wife was with me until late, right? They moved me at like 10, 11 at night time. So they, they took me across this long horde. So UCLH, they've got like the main intensive care wards. And then they've got like, on the right of that, there's a tall building with like 21 floors. Each ward, each floor is a different speciality. And the, the ward I was on was at the infectious unit. Um, so got in there at 11 at night and they give me a buzzer and they're like, there's no one. I'm used to a nurse being there on call all the time. And they're like, right, this is it. And my wife sees on my face, I'm upset because I'm thinking, right, I can't press the buzzer. No one's here all the time to look after me. I'm suddenly coming to that first stage of, sh- like, I'm out of someone's hand. I've got to start doing things. Because mm. that's the first step of going away from. Now, I'm like, as I'm talking now, I'm realizing actually that that was the first step to my recovery process from them, me relying 100% on them mm. to them saying to you, me, right. Mr. Ahmed, it's time now to start. What we, where, where is this going to lead to? Mm, mm. So when I got to that ward, is then when I started realizing, right, this isn't working, that isn't working. Why is that totally black? Why did I keep changing my bandages? When they took off the bandages, and that's when mom and dad and the was wife, the, the arm just was the arm completely like just black, like yeah, it was black. Yeah, it was cold. Do you know, like uh, when you touch ice, literally yeah. ice, it was cold. No blood in it. It was black. And the same with your with your leg as well. Yeah, so my right my right leg was below ankle was all black, 
and my left toes were just black. So the question was, was the first question was, um, right leg, is it going to be below knee or above knee? Because um, that bend that you have in your elbow and in your knee, like it makes a huge difference. We'll come, in, we'll come on to that in a minute. Um, so was that going to be below knee or above knee? The next question was, is the ankle going to stay or the toes going to go? Is half the foot going to go? What's going to go in that one? And the next question after that one was, the left arm, is that left arm going to be below elbow or above elbow? And that was a big one. And that became, the, that became more apparent as the conversations mm. went on and on. Because again, hence the reason, the reason why I said about that elbow in the elbow bend is you then start thinking, right, if I lose my elbow, what am I going to stop being able to do? Mm. Well, I, can you even comprehend it? Because I think, you know, sometimes, yeah, when you have like all your faculties, I think this is the, the case for most people, yeah, like we don't realise how much of a, like this plays a role in our life until we lose something, yeah? And like, you could just lose the ability to just do just one, f just your thumb. You lose your ability to use your thumb, yeah? You think, oh, like, well, I'll be all right without my thumb. All right, cool, you pick up your phone, you go send a quick message, and you're like, oh, shit, I can't even, because you use your thumb to message and that. It's like, your, your, your big toe, for example, it's like you lose your big toe and then your balance is way off. Uh, we, you know, you, like, something happens with your leg or whatever. Let's just say, for example, you can't, like, walk. And then you start thinking about, like, I, I always refer back to having surgery on my knee. I had surgery on my knee. I was out of the game for, like, a month and a half. And it's like the that spontaneity is gone. Like I can't even. I mean, I can still be spontaneous, but in a different way. Yeah. But it's like the way that I'm used to being spontaneous, I can't be spontaneous like that anymore. So I think, like for for me, my mind could tell me like some of the things that I would not be able to do without having an arm. But until you don't have one. I think it's it's just a completely different experience, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. And I've always been, like you asked me earlier about um, what I'm like a person and a bit about me. And I've always been that person that um, I don't take no as an answer, innit? No, I just don't take no as an answer. Like, my brain set doesn't... My, and again, it comes back to my work as well. I've always, I've always, it must be a sudden thing. And my dad, I'm just a salesperson. I don't take no for an answer. Like, I will get a yes out of you somehow. Maybe not today, maybe tomorrow. And the same for my own situation. I don't want to say no, that I can't do this. That's why I do stupid things like motorbikes. And I'll do stupid things on the... On the what, um, now? No, not now, then. Oh. Okay, I was gonna say that is techy. <laughs> right, it's gonna happen. Yeah, yeah, yeah you can get that. That's gonna happen. Yeah, brother. trust me, brother. Bro, trust, trust me. me. Man's gonna be on the bike. Trust one me, day. man's gonna be back <laughs> on the bike. Big ass super bike. Yeah, I'm back. Yeah, yeah, we're gonna get there. Yeah, yeah, we're gonna get so, there. So, but I was always, always a, um, always a person that try it first and then we'll see how it happens. Mm. And that brought me a good situation and bad situations. Yeah, right. We won't go into that. Yeah. So, but I will always try something. Mm. Um, and that's in my nature. So when they start talking about the amputations, I wasn't, and like, I ain't bigging myself up here, but I was never, I was never, the first mind, the first thought was a negative one. The negative thought was there, but the first thought was, okay, how do we handle this? Yeah, you get me? Like, it wasn't the other way around, because I know a lot of a lot of people, like you said, you lose a thumb, or like, I've, I've dislocated, I've, I've know that knee pain, that knee pain is, horrible the ligament pain so like you feel like the worst first before the best of it 100% but I was never like that I was like right uh, this is going to happen one way or the other I've got to let's deal with it but it comes up to that point I was making about I didn't know whether it was going to be above elbow or below elbow especially my left arm and when they said it was going to be below elbow above elbow because they can't self the basically the gangrene was too high so basically the thing with gangrene is they give you two choices some people stay with it like people live with it but it can spread and the other thing is what you're going to do with like like just dead it's dead muscle like it's literally just it's there so there's no point in keeping it anyway because I couldn't use it so I, mm. that was the first question they asked is you can keep it but it's going to be like this mm. so I thought well what's the point um, so then they said right it's going to be above elbow 
And the reason why I keep repeating myself, the reason why that is, is I'm going to say it is, for example, let's say Jim, how do you do bicep curls? Mm. Yeah. How do you do bench presses? Yeah. How do you uh, even like do deadlifts? How do you do deadlifts? Mm. Right. If I had the elbow, if you if you go to fall over somewhere, like if I lean over, I go on my knee. If I'm getting off the floor, if you get off the floor, fine, I haven't got two hands, but it's easier to get off the floor with two elbows than it is to get off the floor with mm. two arms, mm, 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 mm. two hands. So I was always trying to think of the best case scenario rather than, than the worst case scenario through the process. How, what can I say that I'm going to be able to use? So it was a blessing that my below knee was, uh, a below knee was saved. And it was a blessing that my whole left foot didn't go, only my left toes have gone. Right, right, right. So these are the only bad boys, two fingernails I've yeah. got now, basically. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, man, that, that, that's when I found out I wasn't amputated when I woke up. I had to work for it to get and get amputated. Okay. And then obviously now, then that's a whole other transition or period in your life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then that's, that's, when, the, the, that's when I was tested the most mentally because... Um, now, I try to stay pos- positive for the whole process, but then I would have days where I would be upset in myself in terms of why has Allah brought this on me, right? Like, why has Allah chosen to do this to me? Then I have thoughts of, um, like, I'm Muslim, um, and if you haven't noticed, and um, in Islam it says no tattoos, yeah? I had a full half sleeve on the left arm, right? And God suddenly decided, right, brother, I'm taking your left arm. Then I'm thinking, shit, man, he taught me a lesson, taking my left arm off me. Then I start thinking like that, right? Why have I been so bad? Like, why have I not been a better Muslim? Then, like, I spent most of my time in in intensive care with the Quran on in the background because if I, I found I found peace in God at that point, like I'd never turned to Him before, and I felt like a lot of people kept saying to me, "He's testing you," like He's tested you for a reason because He loves you, and I was like, right, I, I use that to to my advantage like yeah you know, I'll, I'll use that as much as I can so that helped a lot um but then I then I would break down the form of well, what what is this going to mean for my kids like the whole football thing how am I going to play football um how am I going to pick up my most my littlest one is two nearly three now then it came down to let's be blunt the wife like, how's the wife going to perceive me mm. and where I struggled a lot during rehab not rehab during Less, like I said rehab, less than rehab while I was in intensive care and in the unit at UCLH, what I struggled a lot with was understanding my wife needs to live her normal life. Mm. Yeah? So I always struggle with the balance of thinking, right, my wife's out there. Like, my wife, I'm punching, innit? My wife is fit, yeah? I'm fully punching. I say it, my boy say it, I say openly, I'm punching. So. Well, uh, shout out to the missus. Yeah, shout out to the missus, mm. man. So, um, yeah, so I'll be like, I'll be getting paralyzed. Like, oh, she's out. She's having a coffee. With, who's she having coffee with? I should go out for dinner. I should go to cinema. I should go out for the spa day. If I was out, normal bodied, she does that anyway. I know. I've never stopped her. She does that anyway. So I was going through a phase of thinking, right? I need, I need to stop being like this because we was getting a lot into a lot of arguments. Then I got into I get into a circle of I'm going to lose her because she's going to see a weak man as well. Like the man's not gonna be able to look after her when I do come out of hospital. So I went through all these emotions while I was, even before I was amputated. But then slowly when the drugs started wearing off, things started coming back round to me. Did you, and like even, you can answer this in two ways, yeah? So like the the past and also now. When did this happen, by the way? When did all this happen? So what, the amputations? Yeah, the amputations. Amputations happened probably around uh, October, September, October time. So not even that, not even long ago at all. Yeah, last year. Okay, I'll just ask you as a solid question. Like, do you feel less masculine? Yeah, I do, yeah, 100%. Because, oh, fucking hell. So... <laughs> but there's certain positions everyone likes it I would say it bluntly that I to feel like you feel like you're in control you know in that situation and I can't do everything no more mm. I said it blunt, blunt as that man like, mm. there's certain things you can't do no more you got to like you said earlier everything becomes a process you lose it you lose um, you lose a thumb you suddenly think you can't use a phone I lost an arm and a leg everything nothing is the same no more 
So I can't do the things I used to do. I try to do, the, to do them. And I've got that, again, going with that, I like to do, I mean, I like to try things and explore things. I am, um, oh, I forgot what my point is going to be. I, I try to do the best I can mm. in a situation and process it and use things around me as best as I can. But it, it's it's proven, it has proven to be difficult, but I'm, I'm coming around to it. Because also the thing, what I was going to come on to, what I was going to say is, I want to do everything now. Do you know, like I said, you said to me there, well, bruv, you're riding bikes now. Bruv, if I could, I'd be riding bikes now. Mm. I've already gone for my car assessment. I'm, I'm going to be driving a car soon. Like, I want everything to be happening now. Mm. I've booked I've booked a holiday. I shouldn't be going on holiday yet. Booked a holiday. You know, I don't I don't want to wait. I, do, I want to do everything now. But as yeah, you want to live your life. You want to live your life, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For me and the kids mm. and my personal trainer, I keep saying to me, bruv, like I go I go into gym. Yeah, I have my down days in gym in it, and it's not even a case of oh, I haven't lifted as much as I want to. It's a case of bruv, I haven't been able to walk backwards today. Mm. Rather small things. I haven't been able to, but I used to jump 20, 20 inch steps, um, boxes, jump boxes, box jumps, but I can't step onto that now. Mm-hmm. I can just about step onto the eight inch one. You see, like with the masculine side of things, it's like, obviously as men, yeah, you grow up with this like mindset of what we have to do as men, in it, yeah. like provide for the home, this, that, carry this, whatever. You know what I mean? We've got to be strong. We've got to, all kinds of stuff in it, yeah. But then for people who don't, who feel less masculine are uh, maybe the ones who at certain times feel like they can't do that for whatever reason. Mm. Do you get what I'm saying? Mm. And if you have been like quite a masculine person in your household mm. and you've come out and like your circumstances have changed, I'm just curious to understand like, that what that what it looks like in regards to the household after that in your own mind because you can still be you we all have levels of masculine and feminine energy and all of these type of things but when you go home now you know do you feel like you can't there's certain things because you can't do certain things you can't say or implement certain things anymore you can't really you know like or being scared to say certain things because you're going to lose your missus do you get what I'm saying it's like you you want to like have this argument or you want to say something you want to just speak your mind but you're thinking right you know what if i'm being this guy i'm not even gonna be able to my business is not even gonna stay no um no no rags bro <laughs> no. i i'm even do you know yeah, what I'm even saying... bro, even like even from the sexual aspect yeah, as well yeah. it's like that's another thing at some point you probably would have thought about a little yeah. bit in it like that how how differently that looks like yeah, do you get what I'm yeah, saying? Yeah, absolutely, but I, I think putting putting it in in that context, I, I don't think like that. Okay. At all. So, and I, if anything, I'm the opposite of that. Right. Like, I get pissed off with people saying, "Oh, let me do that for you," or "Let me do that for you." Let me let me help you with that. Like, yeah, I'm the opposite of that. Um, opposite of that. Like, I, I want to do everything myself. Because, so for example, when I got home, right. Um, then we had to think about, oh, how are we gonna go up? How am I gonna go upstairs? How to get to? Basically, I redesigned a lot of part of my a lot of things in my house to allow me to not feel like that. Right. Do you know what I mean? So my bathroom is redesigned into a point where I don't need no one. To me, that's masculine. Yeah. Someone who turn, comes home and says, "All right, bomb. Do you know what? Can't really do this and that anymore." So. I'm not gonna. Ha- I'm not gonna be in this house making everyone do things for me and that. There's just no way. So obviously you need help though at times, and still accepting help is a good thing in it. But to be able to turn around and say, you know what, yeah, nams, I'm implementing this and I'm doing that or whatever, so I can do my own thing. To me, is a mass, a, a very masculine trait still. Yeah, and I respect that as well for you saying that because I, I mean I've never thought of it like that, but it was like, do you know what it is as well? It's um. It was a case of no one was helping me, Chucky. Like the way this system works, um, to put it bluntly, if you've got savings, if you've been a good, again, yeah, I've been a good husband, a good adult. I've saved money in the bank. I've put money away. 
But if you've done that, the government doesn't want to help. The government won't help you because yeah. you've got too much money. Yeah, yeah. Because you have to start paying for it. Yeah. It's mad, you know. Like, sorry to take this away from you, but yeah. But just, we had the same thing with like my my um, what is it? Like my granddad and that. So it's like my granddad was becoming like just not able to do certain things or whatnot. Yeah, and because he had money in the bank, they was like, firstly, they was like, nah, can't really. But then when they were almost forced to do it, the amount of bread they were trying to come for or after he died was mental, bro. Like, yo, they wanted a crazy amount of bread from him. It's disgusting. It was, and it made me, it just made me, it, it, for a good reason, it got me pissed off, bro. I was like, right, you ain't gonna pay for it. Rags, I'll, I'll pay for it myself. But I'm not gonna lose that independence. Key word being independent. Like, I didn't want to certainly rely, because especially in rehab, you hear, you get off, like you get in rehab you get certain people who are like oh this has happened to me mm-hmm. what's going to happen to me blah blah feeling sorry for themselves but then the opposite end you get the other people who are like no nah, like we're here this is life adapt to it make the best of a bad situation and I was in that category and um, so even from rehab I knew what I'm going to have to do to get home and be myself and not change things because again while I was in a coma Bruv, my, my car insurance was up for renewal. My house insurance was up for renewal. My lease was due to be paid every month. And the lease I was paying was dumb. My wife couldn't afford that. So then it was like she had to, she had to take control of doing all that stuff that I was doing at that point. So I, in my head, I was like, right, I need to get back to getting that back under my control because that's what I do. Like I take, take care of all of that in my house. Basic bills and all that, just I just deal with it. Um, I just find it easier so yeah so coming back to the money situation the reason why I say that is I, I had to do everything myself and that helped me incorporate things into the house that made me independent and I guess coming back to what you said I guess made me feel a bit more masculine mm. and one thing I want to say also while I'm still talking is bruv things that used to be easy I tell you one hard thing to do with one arm great and cheese bruv <laughs> Bro, you don't think about it, bro. I love cheese, great <laughs> cheese, bro. Bro, it's mad. Do you know what I've had to buy? You not laughing, <laughs> bro. I've had to buy zip bags. I had to buy zip bags and like sit there with like the thing in like a vice, almost like a, a vice in my kitchen with a grater thing in it because I don't want no one else doing it for me. What? So, uh, what do you? So what? How do you? That the, so the, the, the grater thing's in the vice, in it. Okay. And it's there with a bag on the. Side. I don't know. I think you're. Oh. <laughs> I think that's cold still, but I think you're missing. Are you trying to do it? Would you like hold the? What type of cheese grate have you got? A metal one. Yeah, and it like it stands up like that, and it's got. No, it's a flat one. Yeah, so I got a cheese grater. Yeah, that's like because it's got different sides to it. Yeah, it? yeah. different sides. Oh, I know which one you've got, bro. You got I'm not gonna lie, you done it wrong. You got the like what you've done is cold, huh? No, this is here. What I'm saying, no, not the palms. Then, yeah, he's got the palm, just the, the one sided one yeah one-sided i've got the one, one, yeah. one-sided one i've got the one where there's like there's like you can grater it in different ways so you can get like the long bit or like the super small defined and then whatever else what you could have done is got one of them because it stands up and then use the chin like this and then grate it bro yeah. that's yeah. light food I don't know if that slipped, you know your chin is good nose is gone bro look at my nose you just strengthen the chin in the process bro you see what i mean about processes though because there's actually a there's a board specifically made for amputees so what this board is right is it sticks to the surface uh what's that called a marble yeah yeah the surface top sticks to it and it's got one side it's got the grated bit so you grate it into like a box underneath and it slides out right. one side's got four spikes so do you know when you're cutting like tomatoes or mushrooms you stick it on there and you just right okay otherwise the thing moves in it so obviously then obviously you must come across like quite a few different yeah, gadgets yeah, and that yeah, and yeah, stuff yeah. which is good that's like those things are good because it's it helps you, it speaks to you being able to just have a bit of independence and do things for yourself. Even if you have to find an alternative way to do it, you find a way. Like we, yeah. And the thing is, we can't even make too much of a thing about that because with evolution, we always find different ways to just do things anyway. Do you yeah, get what I'm yeah. saying? Once upon a time, people weren't great in cheese with that anyway. Do you get what I'm saying? Like Trust they me. was great in cheese in different ways. Like you find different ways to do stuff in um with the circumstance that you're with the circumstance that you're in going back to um just the family element of it though 
So the kids, mm. like, what was like? What was that like? Sort of maneuvering your relationship or like adapting your relationship with your kids? Did it change? Were there like anything that had changed? Um, yeah. So so my who who was eight at that time, turning eight at that time, and um, so he wasn't allowed to come and see me in hospital because my wife took it on herself, which I think was the right decision, to not let him see me at my worst. So he did eventually come and see me in hospital, but once I was able to at least press the buzzer in the hospital, you know what I mean? I wasn't totally just a vegetable. He came and saw me, uh, but it was hard for him. And he did take it hard because my, I'm, I'm closer with him than my youngest one, I always yeah, say. Yeah, yeah. I always say my, my youngest one, the devil child is my wife's and the old, old, oldest one is my one, the good one's my one, yeah. <laughs> so, um, but I, it was a case of just explaining to him that it's not going to be the end. I mean, the key thing for him, as you can imagine, was, Daddy, are you going to be able to kick a ball with me again? Mm. Do you know what I mean? Like, the key thing for him was football. The other thing was, oh, how are you going to play a PlayStation with me? Which I'll come on to in a minute. How are you going to play a PlayStation with me? Because I just bought a PS5. Before I got ill, literally two, three weeks before, I bought a PS5. And um, we started playing. He's like, how are you going to play a PS5 with me? But I've made it I've made it in such a way where I've made it. On my little one, I don't think he's not going to know any different. Yeah, because he was so he, young. He, he won't know yeah. any different. My older one, I've made a point because I've noticed it in him. He wants to spend as much time as possible with me. Mm. Now, like I've made it a point that everything I do, I try to do with him. So I've created a studio stroke office in my house. I've got a desk on this side. He's got his desk on that side. He does his homework when I'm doing my work. He does his homework in there. Um, if I'm if he's going to play football, I've tried to go and watch him play football as much as I can. Even though I can't kick ball, I'll try and watch him play. He wanted to go to cinema. It was going to be hard for me, but I've done it to watch Mario. Yeah, when I watched Mario the other day, that yeah, was great. So I just had to. I've just had to adapt. Again, er, with everything in my life now, I've had to adapt the way we used to do things and still make them fun for them and incorporate it into them and not make them feel like anything's different. Have you also, you've naturally also had to adapt the way that you see yourself as well, right? Like, because the first time, the first time looking at yourself in the mirror must have been like a bit of a challenge yeah, as well, right? I still don't look. Really, yeah? Yeah, I don't have to look in the mirror, yeah. It makes me upset. I don't look in the mirror, yeah. Um, yeah, I just, yeah, I don't want to look. Uh, we, we had a big mirror in front of my um, bed when we uh, rearranged my bedroom for me to come home. And uh, yeah, I got that mirror moved. <laughs> yeah, I love it. So, um, it's all right though, man. The um, playing with the kids, the yeah. cod, the, um, cause you mentioned cod before, I don't know if you play cod with your, your you and that, but like, how do you play PlayStation with them now then? Like, what do you, do you just like? Yeah, so we got a one-handed, con- my sister got me a, a one-handed controller. It's not a controller, it attaches to the PS5. If you look at my socials, basically it's just, it's, it's a rig and it attaches to PS5, and the left analog stick is um, almost strapped to my leg. So when I move the whole controller, the whole left analog stick moves, and on the back, the left L1, L2 is right here. Okay, we're looking at it right now on the screen. You won't which, find one it. Is, which one is you, it? You won't find it. You won't find it? Trust me, guy. Well, how did you get it then? My sister got it from China. A guy, oh, serious? A guy, free, a, guy, a guy 3D prints it, but he doesn't sell them. Oh, really? Yeah. You type in, I don't know, type in maybe PS5 3D printed one hand, I don't know. One hand PS5, put in PS5 3D printed. Yeah, just do that. Go down. Go down. Look, cause I think it might be that one, you know. There you go. Which one is it? Yeah, that one on the left. Which one? Like far left? Or the left and the right, the same thing. Oh, is it? Yeah. You know, that's all the same thing, yeah. Oh, cold. Oh, cold. Yeah. I get it. So that attach, so that attach, that left analog stick attaches to my leg yeah. with a strap underneath. Yeah. So that's it's stuck. And then I've put elastic bands underneath it to make it tight so it's not loose. Yeah. So when I'm moving around, for example, cod, I move around cod like this. And the right analog sticks to aim. Oh, that's cool. Right, you, see, you, see, you, see, you see those um, blue buttons on there? Yeah. They're pressing the arrow keys on the left-hand side. Oh, really? Yeah, so they're pressing the arrow keys. And on the back of, the, back of it, the oh, L, the, on the back of it, the L1 and the L2 are right next to the R1 and R2. 
So it's right there. So all on one side. That's dope. So my sister got me that. How techy are you with it? Yeah, yeah. how techy are you with uh, it? No, it's hard, man. Yeah, yeah have you got, so you've got, you've got better with it though, it's, right? It's muscle memory, isn't it? Yeah. Even if it's muscle memory, so I've st- I've started to get the hang of it, but bruv, these kids on COD, COD bruv, oh my God. Yeah, they're bruv. crazy. Do you know they're I, crazy I, with it. And it's so, bro. I can't play it, bruv. It's too quick for my eyes anyway. But I it stresses can't. me out. Yeah, I know. Yeah, it stressed me. Yeah, it stressed me out as well. But I don't really. I'm not a gamer's like that. But when I decided I'm going to jump in the game thing, and I was just getting smoked left, right, and centre, bro. I jumped in COD for the first time, smoked. Then these lot, these youths are just chatting bare shit on the, the thing and that. That was getting me mad, bro. Like these little kids just chatting shit, and I didn't even have a controller, the thing where I could chat back to them. So they're just chatting shit about man, and I couldn't even give it back. Then I tried the Gears of War thing. That was going 100 miles an hour or whatever. I was getting smoked at that. I said, you know what? Fuck it, bruv. I'm just playing golf. <laughs> I just <laughs> bought golf. <laughs> I bought golf. And then I just stayed with that. Smacked the ball one time. You get what I'm saying? That's me. But, <laughs> but, but, but <laughs> Golf on a PS5 or golf in real life? No, nah, golf on a PS5. Oh, okay. I just thought, you know what? Fuck all of that. Like These are doing all that. I just went on and just, you know, obviously you just scroll, find games and that. I just bought a golf thing. <laughs> and then that was me. Funny guy, man. But, but um, it's, it's um, a thing with Call of Duty. You're going a bit off topic now, but Call of Duty, you have to turn. What's it called? We have to cross play off. Because yeah. these kids on mate, imagine you use a mouse. They're using mouses. How quick are you with that mouse on your PC? Yeah, I'm not. Yeah, yeah. Well, so imagine yeah, they're, they're, they're literally with their mouse. They're there, like with red point, like just shooting you out. Yeah, yeah they're just they're, <laughs> just, they're, they're, they're too techy with it. Well, okay, anyway, um, like, what do you do to keep your mind balanced? Do you know what I mean by that? No. I'm assuming that, like, you would go through, an, a, 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 like, a roller coaster of emotions, yeah? Mm. Maybe even on a, on a day where you're not having so much of a good day. Mm. Like, what kind of things do you do to keep your mind balanced? You do go through, like, counselling, do you have therapy, do you have, like... Is there th- certain things that you do or a place that you go mm. that like kind of helps you just balance your emotions? <laughs> um, but I, I've got into my editing, man. Like, ed- editing like videos and doing the social media stuff is a weird thing. So I've set up my office now, like double screens, the Mac, and I've got my little gadgets and stuff. And once I start editing, I, I zombie out it's weird I find it soothing editing but the other things I do it's just I'm back in the gym I go to the gym three times a week with my personal trainer like gym will forever be my place to go and just like, get away from things um, I'm not driving yet so my PT is sick bro like he's made it so my PT he, he was he wasn't my PT when I went on that weight loss journey the first time but he saw me as that guy in it like, do you know when you start going to gym on a regular basis and you just get to know people because they see you more than once or twice, they're like, yeah, this guy's serious. He saw me go through the whole process of mm. losing that weight. Mm. And he used to always single me out mm. like in the gym, like, oh, what are you up to today? What, do you need help? He used to spot me for free. I'm like, not charging me no money, give me advice about food and all the rest of it. So when I got out of rehab, even while I was in rehab, I started doing physio and the physios weren't doing it for me. So I called him this guy and I was like, look, you need to get me back in the gym, innit? Bro, the guy didn't jump, big up Jermaine. He didn't want to take a paycheck, bro. He was like, I'll do it for free, innit? Like, I, I pay him, obviously, but he said, I'll, I'll do it for free. Um, so me getting away with him three times a week, that's my getaway, man, the gym. Mm. And also, it was important for me to find a gym that didn't have riffraff, I'm sorry, but I couldn't go to a gym where riffraff were just staring at me because mm. I was of what I was doing, how I was doing it, what I was doing, because my exercise is again coming around back to having to adjust to this way of living now. I can't do the usual exercises. I have to do the basic things yet. So I'm still learning to walk with no toes. Yeah. Um, I'm still learning to squat because I can't bring my leg my knee all the way over my toes to squat. So I'm still learning to squat. Um, 
I'm, the, the, the simple thing I'm learning, still learning so I didn't want to be in a gym like that so big up also I'll do a quick plug to PT Studios in Hainaut in Essex so this gym's got a sick setup so their setup is PT only so like a barber chair the PTs pay a rent and the PTs can bring their own clients Right. so in that gym everyone is paying for a PT and PTs are not cheap if you've had a PT you will know PTs are not cheap so you won't get referred to that mm. gym everyone's come like bruv yeah, yeah everyone's got money out I was going to say a name then but yeah <laughs> <laughs> no, I love that you mentioned before like you talked about God and stuff um, and your like your relationship with your religion and that like you obviously went through a period where you like questioned mm. a lot of that like talk on that a bit yeah and can I cut I, I, I talk about that also linking that back to what the point you just made religion is also my getaway now I would right. say because um, I, I I find it peaceful now now like if I little things that like I go to the cemetery I try, I try to go and see people that have passed away like um, my grandma had Parkinson's really bad and she lived with us and um, but I used to feed her and help her and all the rest of it and I even helped bury her but never went to the graveyard once since burying her and then I got uncles in there who was really tight my cousin lost his dad really young and my cousin's been going every day every week sorry maybe twice a week to go and see his dad so he said to me like bro I find it peaceful come with me and I went with him once or twice and yeah I find it really peaceful and even going back to the question you just asked now doing being closer to God and doing things like Friday prayers in Islam which I missed Friday prayers for years small things I don't I don't pray five times a day but I've stopped doing things like drinking I've stopped doing things like yeah I was doing a whole lot not eating halal meat like I was doing all the rest of it on nights out as well so stopping all that and just finding peace in thinking of him it's just changed me inside like I, I don't, like I said I don't pray five times a day but I feel like something inside me has clicked to say be thankful and I thank him as much as I can and I also pray to him as him or her as much as I can um, no fuck that I pray to him as much as I can so yeah man <laughs> <laughs> do you do you rem do you remember your dreams? Go on, you go finish your question. <laughs> Is that the question? Because I will go into a mad one about dreams. I was just going to ask you what your dreams look like. Sometimes now, just yeah. Now, um, I don't. Do you, do you, oh, it's mad. So I've started having dreams recently because uh, there's certain medications my cousin advised me to take that have helped me. Um, but my dreams consist of things that have happened before when I was better rather than things that are to happen mm. so things that have happened and I'm remembering and I wake up and I shut sh good memories and bad memories and the reason why I asked you to finish your question was the dreams during my um, coma bruv mad elaborate so for example, I was um, I used to have a waterbed that wasn't electronic, so it used to do like this moving motion all the time, uh, every few seconds move. The reason for that is elderly people they get back sores when you lie down for too long, so they keep the bed moving. I'm bed bound now for quite a few months, so the dreams well at the beginning I was going to be bed bound, so they kept me on it. But the dreams I was having was I would be on a island and I can see myself out of body experience on the island not even an island like jetties you know, like the, the jetties you walk on on holiday they're moving in the water and everyone else is talking to me but they're on their own islands and they're talking to me and then I asked a guy right in rehab because he asked me a similar question like bro did you have dreams while you was in a coma because he, he was in a coma as well and uh, I go yeah and he goes did you ever have the dreams about being on like an island or on water 
and uh, he goes yeah, and he goes yeah and the reason why he he done re his research the reason why we got those dreams is because we was lying on a waterbed okay <laughs> the waterbed was the reason why we were getting that another crazy dream I, was, I would have is I would be in this laundrette for weird reason this laundrette that was near my house that I used to pass uh, when I was in school so when I was in high school we used to go to the chicken shops the chicken shop used to be next to the laundrette so we used to walk to that laundrette Past laundry to go to the chicken shop. But the dream I kept having was I was in this laundry, I was locked in this laundry. People are in this forest opposite this laundry, but I can't get to the forest. But people are visiting me in this laundry upstairs. And I can see like the T junction where this laundry is, the road actually is there in real life. But I can't see nothing else but laundry, some people in the forest, they sometimes visit me, they sometimes go. And there's also a fridge with a cold strawberry yazoo in it. <laughs> yeah? And the madness is, right? And I, but I can't get to the strawberry yazoo. The reason why I can't get to... I don't know why I can't get to the strawberry yazoo, but the madness, Chucky, is my wife... I told my wife this story. Well, I think she heard it on a podcast I did on my side with my boy. And she said the reason why he was having that dream is because when he was still awake but on the machines... He kept saying and writing. So when I had the tubes in my throat, apparently I still could write, but I couldn't say because of the tubes were in my throat. But I kept writing, I need a cold, I want a cold yazoo. Okay. I kept saying that to them, but I don't remember that. But I was having those dreams, right? Now, did those dreams happen? Was that happening and it wasn't a dream? Mm. Or, uh, yeah, it's all mud, bro. Yeah, it's, it's mad. madness. Yeah, it's mad. It's That's mad. why I stopped to ask you, well, why are you asking me now? What part of the dreams? Because I thought you were going to ask me about the coma dreams. Oh, no, no, no. I didn't even know you had dreams in the coma. Yeah, you know? yeah, I didn't yeah. even know that was, was a thing. madness. I thought that you, like, I had a, a neuroscientist on the pod a while ago. Yeah. And we was talking about consciousness and that. And, like, like being on, like, euthanasia, for example, it's like the difference between dreaming mm. and then, like, being on euthanasia. Yeah. Is, is interesting because when you go to sleep you have a uh, an, you have a concept of time that you've kind of like gone to sleep yeah but when you have euthanasia you yeah. don't have a concept of that you got you just completely knock out and then you you wake up and you're like rah like you're a bit delirious like wait how is that how long it's gone or whatnot and you don't really it's like almost like probably what it's like to be dead you don't think not, there's nothing it's, just, it's black it's yeah black. it's black but then when you're sleeping you sometimes will have but I thought that being in a coma was almost like being on euthanasia like it's just nothing I mean look I, I, that, that six weeks in this coma plus the three months in intensive care on all the drugs it's all mixed into one yeah I so hear I, you I, you know what I mean so I could I, have, I might have even been awake and that was happening and I, I see it as a dream mm. but and then I keep thinking back to one dream where I, there's a doctor Bro, do you know like these new Google 360 cameras? Yeah. And you can do that angle where everything's like, like a bubble, like bubble, everything's around you. Like, what's that old Dizzy Rascal tune? Where he's, oh my God, in his video, he's in, he's shouting at this bubble, the 360 cameras around him. I forgot what that Dizzy Rascal tune, well, which one was it? Oh my God, it's gonna bug me. But anyway, it felt like I was in this bubble and there's a doctor, everyone's like, the doctors are looking at me and like a little bug in the middle, but all around here. Oh, I was fucked up, man. I'm tripping out myself now. <laughs> I think I smoked too much pot. Uh, yeah, yeah. Do you know what I mean? Do you still smoke? Uh, I, I stopped smoking fags, and um, so I, I didn't want to get back into that cycle. So I got hold of myself with, um, a pen. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Yeah, a vaping pen. But it's doing me well. Do you know what it helps with? Do you know what it is, um, Chucky? I get a lot of phantom pain. Is that the fa is that the pain where it's like it's in your arm but it's not in your arm yes, basically. Yeah, basically? Yeah, yeah. So especially at night time when the thing is when the brain wants to switch off, it starts thinking of other things that it wants to think about. And guess what? It wants to think about the phantom arm. pain. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah so yeah. there's two types of things: it's phantom pain and fa phantom sensation. Phantom pain I get a lot in my left foot. I'm getting it right now as we speak. Like the toes are hurting. Okay. Like, really painful. My right foot, luckily, I don't get a lot. But at the beginning, I'd be walking, yeah, and my right foot would just start hurting. The worst one, it would start itching. <laughs> my right foot. Oh, yeah, I was going to say, oh, I, I had that in my notes, actually. Yeah, the right Yeah, like, how does that, see the itch? Yeah, how does that, What? how does that work? Like, how do you get, how do you get rid of that? 
literally by looking at it making the brain realise bro you're, you're tripping out your foot's not there yeah 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 because yeah. what, what's happened is they describe it in, in rehab the physios they put a model up of a, a face they get taught in physio in the hospitals that um, the face in your mind now your nose is here your ears are here mm -hmm. your your neck is here they use that in their physiology physiotherapy technical terms they have terms for it but that's what the brain's happened to the brain now the brain hasn't realised where your nerve endings finish mm -hmm. so right now my arm feels like it's about here mm -hmm. that's called phantom sensation um, but what some people it disappears what happens is your arm gets shorter and shorter and then it just disappears or go mm. some people it stays for life mm. some people it takes a year or two so pray for me man <laughs> yeah man. yeah no for sure <laughs> trust me um just a couple of more things yeah like what keeps you going the thought of being normal like the thought of knowing that what's normal like one day this like do you know you see these people like, right, is like people text me sometimes saying, Oh, Janae, like, look at this guy on Instagram, look at that guy on Instagram, boys do it, and like, no disrespect to them. I know why they're doing it, but these guys and girls have been amputated for years like right. two, three years. I've been amputated since October, like, it's a I've got a long, long road ahead of me. So, the what keeps me going is knowing that I'm going to get there, like, seeing these people because a lot of these people have got this is my first leg. Chucky, I'm going to go through. I spoke to my boy this morning. Um, he was in the car with me. My boy, who was in, I was in rehab with, he's got a wicked story. He's only he's been out of rehab one month, two months b before me, and he's had three legs. So imagine over a year how many legs you're going to go through because mm. the stump's going to shrink, your, your legs going to shape's going to change. You're going to get a better other casting this week for a new leg. So what keeps me going is knowing that these things are going to happen. I started researching into. Uh, legs in a private sector because I want to get back into the gym properly and start running so I started looking into things like bionic legs legs that got micro processes in them um, so knowing that those options are out there and they're going to get better keeps me going Right. my kids keep me going knowing my kids want to see their dad get back to that strength or being able to do those things because there's a lot more that I'm looking forward to being able to do Mm. Um, I haven't done half of the things that I was doing before the, the simple things I haven't kicked a ball at my signing goal yet no. I haven't got the balance to be able to go over walk up to a ball and swing my foot through it because mm. at the moment it feels like my foot's going to go either flying or that way <laughs> do yeah, you know yeah, what I mean I hate that. I it's going to come off my leg <laughs> and, I, and, I, and, I'm, and I'm going to turn into a meme bro Man, man's not ten, trying to turn into a meme Trust me, you get turned into a meme quick these days. So I'm not trying to turn into a meme. So yeah, but knowing, knowing I'm going to be able to do those small things because my you wife- You've got an amazing, can I just, I'm sorry to stop you, yeah? Your sense of humor is incredible, bro. I promise you, bro. Your sense of humor is incredible because I know, like, and, and, and adding into the context that this did not happen that long ago. Yeah. Do you get what I'm saying? Like you, just mentioned just before that like sometimes people will show you people that have like been going through this either from birth or that they've just had this for years so I think for a lot of people to even even incorporate an element of that sense of humour takes years for them to do that like bro you're you've got you've got a great sense of humour you're like you're super engaging in that and it's you said you said that you're a person, like you talk your way into certain things and you you can get a yes out of, you ain't lost it, bro. <laughs> trust you me. You ain't lost it. Why do people still working? <laughs> uh, are you still working? <laughs> yeah, trust yeah? me. I got back to work as soon as possible, bro. Do you know how jarring talking about medical stuff for nine to 12 months gets? Yeah, yeah. You just want to get out in life and have normal conversations right, with yeah. normal people right. who are living normal lives. Yeah. You got four limbs, I've got two and a half. Yes. No matter, let's just talk in it. Right. Because my rec recruitment is just talking to people. Yeah. People, like recruiters are probably, estate agents are still worse, yeah? Yeah. So, bro. Yeah, yeah. Estate, <laughs> estate agents are still worse, but we just talk in it, we just talk. Do you know what? As we're doing the sense of humour stuff, yeah? Yeah. <laughs> Let me tell you something, yeah? We really do give thanks because I actually thought, I actually thought that you didn't have no limbs at all. Mm. So when you walked in, 
I hope you take this right. Mm. But I was like pleasantly surprised mm. and in some way just lightly happy. Not like no disrespect to anyone who don't have no limbs. Mm. But like I just thought, oh, do you know what? Like, yeah, like you're walking, you're doing like, do you understand what I'm saying? You got like, yeah, you don't have two legs, but you got one. Like you don't have both um, both arms, but you got one. Like m when you when you start getting into that process of thinking, ah, oh, like someone actually doesn't have any. When mm. you see them walking in with something, you're like, nah, you know what? Like mm. you got something, and you're making the most out of it with that. Do you know what I mean? Because at first, when I, when I thought he didn't have any, I was like, Sheila kept saying to me, yeah, I just spoke to him on the phone, and I'm just, and in my head, I'm, it's baffling my, but I didn't want to be in a. Pro I'm just thinking. How is this? And then you're on road and that. Like, I'm thinking, how are you on road and doing all of these things on your ones? Mm. But it makes all the sense in the mm. world. You get what I'm saying? Adding to the fact that you're a person who, one, doesn't, like, say no. Mm. Yeah. You're obviously very, um, like, you're very persistent, which is always, always going to help with your recovery and doing things and your experience and all of that type of stuff. And then the other thing is, like, your, your charisma and your personality hasn't gone anywhere. Do you know what I mean? And like, I think as difficult as it is for you, and I can't even fathom how difficult it is, I think that like, there's so much positive things to look forward to in the long term because of these attribute, attributes that you have. They mean something, bro. Do you get what I'm saying? Yeah, they absolutely. mean something. There's so much people that would have, that, and I get it. If they did, if they was at home and they was just in bed and they just like, they felt like the world was against them and they gave, they gave up on their religion, they gave up on their God and all these type of things. I could under, I could sympathise with that. But I just think it's such a testament to your character that you have said that you've obviously got closer to your, to your God, you, you, your religion. Also, you've like, you've kind of tried to straighten out the situation with your wife in regards to like allowing, like living her life without you like constantly arguing with her and like tr trying to be a father, be it still being a, a masculine person in the household and not like allowing life to beat you up. Bro, I, bro, I, I, you don't even understand how much respect I've, like here, like literally sitting down and having a conversation with you, the more that you talked, just the more that my respect for you just grew, bro. Thank you. Honestly. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. But bro, I listen, think, man. Go on, sorry, do you want to? Yeah, I was going to say, I think I should sit my dad in this couch, not me. <laughs> dad, you got to be this guy, Chucky, yeah? You know, psychiatrists, counselors, bro, they're a waste of time. <laughs> Chucky will see you for free. <laughs> now, nah, listen, thank you for coming, bro, and share, talk, you, sharing your story and stuff like that, man. Thank and, you, bro. And all the best. And at some point, we'll, we'll, we'll wrap again. You get what I'm saying? Once you've, like, you know, lived a little bit more life, you know, gone and done some things, had some holidays, done some things, tried some stuff yeah. and whatnot and moving around smooth, then we'll, we'll reason again, man. But yeah, thank you for coming, bro. I appreciate it, man. Yeah? yeah. Um, love for listening, everyone, yeah? Thanks. <laughs>